Quorum here. I like punctuality. Yeah, appreciate that. <laughs> okay, looks like we have the vice mayor. Let's make sure. Okay, it looks like he's connected. Great. Okay, well, welcome everyone to the Smart Cities and Services Improvements Committee. This is the April 7th. 2022 meeting. And before we begin, I just want to remind everyone of our code of conduct. This is both for our committee members and members of the public. Um, and this includes commenting on the specific agenda item only and addressing the full body, not individual members of the body. Public speakers will not engage in a conversation with the chair, council members, or staff. All members of the committee, staff, and public are expected to refrain from abusive language. Repeated failure to comply with the code of conduct, which will disturb, disrupt, or impede the orderly conduct of this meeting may result in removal from the meeting. Okay, the meeting of the Smart Cities and Services Improvements Committee will now come to order. And the clerk, please call the roll. Licardo. Jones. Present. Foley. Cohen. Here. Mahan. Here. Thank you. Thank you. And just a small reminder here that um, the committee deferred the lease and asset management system status report on the work plan to this meeting from, from March. So we just moved that back a month and we will hear that today. Otherwise, I, I don't believe there are any changes that I need to comment on. Rod, did you want to uh, give us a quick overview of what we'll be covering today? Yes, Chair. Uh, so good afternoon, Chairperson Mahan. Uh, Mayor Licardo, Vice Mayor Jones, committee members, and members of the public. Rob Lloyd, Deputy City Manager for the City of San Jose. Uh, for our April meeting, city staff will present three items. Uh, first, under agenda item D1, the Finance Department will present on the City Roadmap Initiative for Procurement Improvement. This follows up on previous City Council and Committee direction to return. Julia Cooper, Director of Finance, Jennifer Chang, Deputy Director of Finance uh, for Purchasing and Risk will present. Second, we have that uh, City uh, Work Item on the citywide lease and asset management system. This item responds to a city auditor report and direction from city council to return to this committee with status. Nancy Klein, director of the Office of Economic Development and Cultural Affairs, as well as Kevin Ice, real estate manager, uh, division manager from her team, and Sudhir Vangati, uh, an IT products projects manager for us in the IT department will present on that item. And then last, uh, we have D3, which is a, a cross departmental team updating the committee on the city's data initiatives leading to impact and equity efforts. A harsh, or sorry, a Matt Lesh, uh, Public Works Assistant Director, Vince Pereira, Department IT Manager for Transportation, Arthi Tangri, um, our Data Architect in the IT Department, um, and Albert Dehami, the city's Digital Privacy Officer, will share um, as a group. And with that, um, I think Julia is starting us off. Yes, um, thank you. Um, good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. Happy to be here today. Um, Jennifer will give a bulk of the presentation, um, but I just wanted last fall, we came and provided you a brief status report on where we were in re-engaging GuideHouse, and you challenged us to come back to you in the springtime with a status report, and here we are. We met your challenge, and one of the recommendations we have for you is to refer the item along with the full complete reports to the entire city council at their May 3rd meeting. So with that, I'm going to turn over to Jennifer, and she's going to go over at a high level some of the, the executive level summary from GuideHouse in terms of uh, the work that they have done for us over the last few months. So with that, thank you. Thank you, Julia. Hello, Chair Mahan, committee member, city staff. I'm Jennifer Chang, Deputy Director for Finance for Purchasing and Risk Management. 
So we're here to talk about procurement improvement, and it is a strategic support item on the city roadmap. So to remind folks what that was, what the goal of procurement improvement is, is we're trying to increase the organizational capacity, efficiency, and effectiveness of city procurements with the focus across the entire value change. And as a key component of that effort, the city engaged in an RFP and uh, contracted with a consultant guide house to complete a comprehensive assessment of the city's procurement processes. That effort kicked off initially in February 2020, but it was put on hold due to the pandemic and the need to redivert staff attention to address uh, procuring items for the pandemic. We officially re-kicked off that effort in October 2022, and this presentation, as Julia said, is going to provide you an executive summary of Guide House's observations and key recommendations. So as a reminder to the committee, the city has three different procurement processes. The purchasing division of the finance department, which I oversee, is responsible for the procurement and contracting of equipment, goods, non-consulting services, as well as IT. We have a wonderful, hardworking team of 15 who perform this work. City departments are responsible for procuring all consulting services with oversight from the city manager's office. And Public Works is responsible for the procurement of construction and capital improvement projects. So the scope of Guide House's work was initially focused on just finance-led procurements, but after having identified potential efficiencies and collaborative audit recommendations with the city manager's office, we later expanded to include department-led consulting procurements here. So Guide House's approach was to initially conduct 76 interviews with city staff to do a detailed assessment of the city's procurement processes and to understand challenges. Guide House has also provided data from city staff. They use that data to, con to conduct analysis and compared um, our procurements to best and leading practices nationwide. So as a result of those efforts, Guide House produced a current state report that captured and documented key issues in the city's procurements. So this slide here provides a fishbone diagram of the key themes uncovered from that assessment. So the turquoise dot here represents department-led procurements and the marigold dot represents finance-led procurements. And you can see they bucketed these themes into five major categories. Under people, Guidehouse identified that there is a lack of long-term investment in staffing. There's high turnover and there is a desire for better customer education, onboarding and training in our procurement processes. Um, with regards to process, our purchasing processes are generally not well understood. Um, with regards to our decentralized consulting procurements, they lack a mechanism to ensure compliance with city policies, and a lot of departments are doing procurements in disparate ways. Under technology, Guidehouse found that our financial management system, FMS, which is over 30 years old, is effective, but it's outdated. They did find that our e-procurement system, Bedingo, does the job, but there is a desire for some training from some city staff. For some procurements and contract requests, there is a desire from staff to more easily view status updates, know when there's something in their court that they have to do. And we don't currently have systems out that allow folks to submit, automate, and track those requests. And by extension, we don't currently have technology that allows us to easily automate and track key performance indicators. How we uh, pull that data right now is very manual. With regards to policies, Guidehouse found that some policies are difficult to implement, such as the three quotes uh, informal procurement process. It's difficult to implement those policies in a way that ensures compliance. And across the board, staff expressed that the current competitive procurement threshold of $10,000 is too low. Backlog, purchasing staff has a significant procurement backlog. It was exacerbated from the pandemic, and it does hamper our ability to procure needed goods and services in a timely manner for departments. So Guidehouse conducted five visioning sessions after this with city leadership and key stakeholders to envision the future of procurement at the city. Guidehouse used that feedback and the current state assessment to help us develop a salient mission statement and future state recommendations. So the mission statement we came up with is, as stewards of public funds, the city of San Jose facilitates a transparent, competitive process that responsibly equitably and efficiently procures goods and services at the best value for the city. 
And at some future date, we would love to get to a point where we are decreasing procurement processing times. Uh, city staff is getting the support they need to uh, action their procurements, that we are developing a vendor pool that represents the diversity of our residents and our businesses, that we continue to act as stewards of public funds by ensuring you know, our, 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 our tax dollars are spent in a responsible manner. And critically, the future state envisions that purchasing has a seat at the table in the city's roadmap planning and other large scale initiatives so that we can be a strategic partner at the forefront. Also in the future, these are the various roles that we aspire all of our purchasing stakeholders to play. So in the future, purchasing staff is appropriately staffed and supported. The city manager's office is in a position where they are setting the strategic direction for procurement within the city. City departments are getting what they need in a timely manner. Vendors are, we're attracting a wide breadth of vendors that represents our diversity and that they're participating in our procurements in a transparent and fair way. And that we are using those procurements to deliver excellent services to our residents. So on to the recommendations. So Guidehouse categorized its recommendations into five major pillars. We've got technology, training, procurement streamlining, procurement consistency, and staffing. And each of these pillars represents a key component of developing and refining our procurements. The categories laid out here are in ascending order of importance. And so we'll go through each one at a high level in the subsequent slides. This is the executive summary for technology. And you'll see with these slides that the Guidehouse divides recommendations in, with each pillar into three, um, three categories, quick wins, things they feel that are achievable within one year, medium term, things they think that are achievable within one to two years, and long term, two to five years. So some of the key highlights for technology, they are recommending that we spend some time cleaning our data. We have some systems that are um, producing different types of data. We're not quite sure why. Um, developing dashboards using our existing tools to automate and track KPIs where we can. And uh, leveraging SharePoint more to centralize purchasing documentation for city departments. Uh, another recommendation is using process automation technologies to change how we collect and work with departments on their procurement and contract requests. And long term, that is eventually replace our financial management system, FMS. So finance agrees with all this. Uh, we have included in this year's budget process placeholder funds for technology. On training, they are recommending a redesign of the purchasing interest in that site so that it is focused on providing training to with a customer focused uh, uh, customer fund customer focused um, um, focus. So right now, right, the purchasing website has a lot of information on it, but it's not really easy for somebody who's new at the city to quickly understand how they need to procure things and how to do that in a compliant way. Um, they are recommending that we introduce contract and procurement trainings, include, including modular trainings, because not everybody does procurement day in and day out. It's probably best to provide those trainings in bite-sized pieces. In the medium term, they're recommending conducting a disparity study and also developing an annual training program for purchasing staff. And in the long term, standardizing onboarding for purchasing staff, developing a formal vendor outreach program, and implementing a learning management system. So we agree with all this. Um, a lot of it is contingent on having adequate staffing to take on the work and the funding for the requisite studies and training platforms. For procurement streamlining, they're recommending that the city conduct a risk posture assessment with stakeholders with regards to insurance requirements, contract terms, informal procurements. We support this. Purchasing doesn't necessarily own all of these practices, but we are tasked with executing it. So that does make our jobs a bit challenging. Uh, we support having a review, um, but it does require the participation of multiple stakeholders across their or, or organization. Updating the wage theft prevention policy. 
we agree this is a very important item and it must be worked through with our various city stakeholders. Uh, they're also recommending developing a muni code review process. And one of those key recommendations is a one-time adjustment of our $10,000 competitive threshold to $12,000. Our response, we think we can go higher than that. So we're currently evaluating whether or not it's appropriate to go up to 20,000, perhaps 25,000. Um, we don't want to get too crazy, but we do want to make sure that's something that makes sense and it's manageable for the city. Achieving procurement consistency. So some of these recommendations include redesigning the use of the informal three quotes process that encourages the department compliance and expanding the use of cooperative agreements for simple low risk procurements where there isn't a diversity of manufacturers or resellers. Um, another recommendation is having departments come to purchasing staff first when they have a need so that we can identify the correct procurement strategy at the outset. And we hope this is something that technology may help us accomplish. And uh, there are some notes here on department consulting recommendations, which I will come back to on a subsequent slide. And addressing the backlog. So one of Guide House's key finding is that purchasing staff is inadequate which is demonstrated by the increased demand for our services without increased staffing. So just to illustrate, um, even before the pandemic, the workload of the purchasing work group that was responsible for purchase orders and low bids increased by 196% from 2010 through 2019 with no change in staffing. If you include the last two pandemic, pandemic years, that number jumps to 250%. And the work group that is responsible for complex requests for proposals and contract activities, the demand for their services recently grew by 13% annually. So Guidehouse is recommending a series of recommendations for phase staffing over several years to ensure that our staffing levels align with procurement demand from departments. They emphasize that hiring and staff augmentation is a critical step for in order for all the recommendations that I mentioned before to be actionable. Our response, we are taking this under advisement and we have submitted placeholder funds in this year's budget cycle for staffing, which will be considered along with other city priorities. So consulting procurements. One of the key highlights from Guidehouse is that they are recommending more purchasing oversight over department-like consulting procurements with eventual centralization of department, cent department procurements to purchasing over a five-year period. So this recommendation is under consideration. We're not sure that a fully centralized model is optimal for our city. We do agree that finance purchasing staff is best positioned to train, provide advice, and mitigate risk on department-led procurements, but if we think that a finance was staffed in a way where we can provide training, consultative advice to departments, that may be enough for us to achieve the desired improvements we want to see without having to go to a fully centralized model. We think that 80-20 rule could be very effective here and full centralization may not be necessary. So this is something that we will evaluate as we consider how to implement. And this is the last slide. This slide shows Guidehouse's recommended implementation plan from now through the uh, next five years. So as you can see, Guidehouse left implementation fairly open-ended because a lot of this is contingent on city decisions, on staffing investments, reorganizations, uh, policy and practice decisions, things of that nature. And the ability to action these recommendations is again, contingent on sufficient staffing, funding, and importantly, long-term institutional buy-in. And that concludes my presentation. We're happy to take any questions. Thank you, Jennifer. And, and thank you, Julia and, and the entire team. We will head over to public comment before the committee weighs in. And when we're ready here, great. We'll start with call in user number one. I don't quite understand how the city is involved in wage theft. Uh, 
any type of wage theft or wage problem, you get to go to the state. Um, I don't know how it's a city problem unless it, it, these are, from what I can maybe gather, that it's a city contract and, and the people who are contracted are ripping off the workers or whatever. But anybody listening who's ever had wage theft, there is the state of California industrial relations, uh, industrial relations office. Uh, in downtown San Jose, I believe off the Seo de San Antonio, not far from City Hall, maybe a few blocks. But if anybody has their wages stolen or there's discrepancies, you need to go there immediately. And they usually will rectify the situation. I've gone there numerous times and they've always, I, I've won every single time. So I think maybe you're going to need to direct people there because ultimately the state of California has an income tax that they want paid by you and the employer. So and I also find it strange that you guys would hire people who would rip off people's wages. I thought you guys were better than that. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Blair? Blair, you are still muted. There you go. I'm unmuted now. Hi, thank you. Blair Beekman here. Happy meeting. Uh, thanks for the meeting today. Uh, yeah, I had kind of a similar question. Uh, I, I'd like to learn how uh, wage theft issues can be a bit more connected uh, to procurement things. Uh, I felt it was interesting. I think it's, uh, if you're including wage theft ideas in procurement, that's uh, considering human rights practices and ideas in, in how to consider the procurement process. Uh, for both staff and the future of your technology and data collection. Thank you. That is just so incredibly awesome to hear. And, uh, you know, you just had an item, I think yesterday at Open Rules and Open Government about San Jose has become like a, a welcome city. It's like the, now it's the second largest welcome city in the country. There's good sanctuary city policy practices to develop the future of procurement uh, based on those ideals is an important concept and, and learning to, to want to practice our better ideals and offer that when when vetting people for, for work and for data collection practices. Uh, that's really important stuff. It's, it, it's really, it, it's, it's our better human rights selves and, and better persons that, uh, that to put that out front instead of leave it, leaving it coolly in the back uh, that's, I think we're trying to learn how to do that and it takes humbleness and practice. Good luck in how we can do that. Uh, you know, the work I do with, with data collection, uh, openness and accountability, you know, with the procurement of technology, we're at a place with the beginning procurement of technology, we can ask better for, you know, civil rights and civil protection ideals within the procurement process. I know you're trying to do that with your AI stuff, uh, civil protection ideas. Uh, good luck on really growing that right now. We are at a time to do this, and you're speaking of it really well today. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Let's come back to the committee. Let's see if my colleagues have any comments or questions. Otherwise, okay, great. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Chair. And uh, Rob, uh, you know, whenever I see centralization and decentralization, you know, you know where I'm going, right? Can you? Um, if we don't standardize these processes and, and decentralize and let the various departments kind of do their own thing, doesn't, isn't that counterproductive to what you're trying to, to accomplish? Yeah, um, council member, this is, this is Julia Cooper, director of finance. I think the issue on the, on the centralization versus decentralization is really core around the conversation of consulting services which right now is highly decentralized for um, and across the organization. With respect to the procurement work that Jennifer does, that, that still remains highly centralized and we don't, we don't propose any change there. So, so we kind of want to look at the, some of the guidehouse recommendations that kind of, you know, kind of implement some of those and see where we might get to what I'd like to call the sweet spot before we ultimately think about 100% centralization with the realization that a lot of departments and their consulting services, you know, are highly technical things that they're trying to, to procure and that maybe we don't need to staff up to that full level to get to centralization, but we can have the right resources and purchasing to help them through their procurement processes in a more efficient way. 
So, so that's the only area where we're, we're grappling with the centralization versus decentralization concept. Right, and, and I get it, and, and it really is about the process. I understand that each department has subject matter experts and they're the ones that are most knowledgeable about the requirements, but there should be some standardization in terms of the process that they go yes, through. Yes, and, and, and that's what we believe um, that we can bring to the table and help departments with that process and just trying to and work towards that and, and see how much we can improve the internal process regarding uh, consulting services. Great. Thank you, Julia. That was it, Chair. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, I'll just pick up on that. I, I appreciate Julia and Jennifer the way you're talking about that one. I think um, I would be skeptical of going all the way to centralization, but it sounds like you're really thinking about, as you said, the sweet spot or the 80-20. That, that sounds... Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense to me. So I just appreciate that you're being very deliberate and how you're thinking about that. I, I also appreciated the, the mission statement. I did, I did have a few questions. Um, one is, and this is sort of high level and maybe a bit high in the sky, but um, are, are there types of purchases or agreements or licenses or or thinking about it a different way, steps in a, a standard process. I understand every uh, RFP is, is unique, but is there a class of purchases, purchasing decisions we make, or a step in the process that's more universal where we might be able to pool our evaluation with other agencies? And I, and I know that sounds crazy, but um, it just strikes me that across the country, there's something on the order of 100,000 governments and government agencies. I think it's almost 80,000 municipalities. And it, it does seem kind of crazy to me that we have all these governments sort of operating in a silo, performing very similar functions and services, but running their own procurement processes. And so I don't know if we've ever explored partnering with the county or other entities on any of these particular classes of, of procurement. But um, is, that, is that something we've considered? Is that at all possible? Thank you for the question, Chair. So um, we can maybe look at strategies where it makes sense. We I could say that we have done uh, procurements where we have partnered with other agencies. Rob, um, your cybersecurity RFP is case in point. That was a seven package um, RFP, very complex. And um, we structure that RFP so that other agencies can uh, directly benefit from results of the RP, and they actually participated in that RP as evaluation uh, panel members, I believe. Um, another area where we actually did that was with, with regards to the affordable housing portal. Um, that was something where the housing department ended up partnering, I believe, with San Mateo County and another local agency on seeing um, whether or not we could achieve efficiencies in um, our contract dealings with the select vendor. So it, it's kind of, I would say it's kind of a, a procurement by procurement basis. It kind of just depends on the need and whether or not there are some existing relationships that the departments, uh, customer departments have with other agencies, but that's certainly um, areas where, you know, we're happy to explore if it makes sense. And Jennifer, don't you also look for collaborative uh, procurements where you can essentially join in like office supplies, right? Yes, exactly. Um, cooperative agreements are areas where are things that we've actually done already. Um, we do that for office supplies, um, fleet vehicle purchases, things where, you know, the state or other agencies have a larger purchasing power. It just makes sense for us to actually leverage their procurements rather than do our own. Um, and we want to, through, through this procurement improvement process, probably put out better guidelines for departments so they better understand when it's appropriate to use or not use cooperative procurements. Yeah, thanks for that context. And I, I was familiar with the two examples you gave, but they, they still felt kind of, as, as you, I think, said, Jennifer, kind of individual, sort of a bespoke arrangement, sort of like, okay, for this one time, this one this one project. I think I was thinking more about the latter category of collaborative procurement where we're sort of um, drafting off of somebody else's work or maybe some other agency wants to draft off of the, the analysis and evaluation that we're doing. Obviously, every organization has unique needs, but to the extent possible, I mean, a lot of the technology and equipment we purchase, I'm sure is very, very similar to what other cities and counties are doing. So is, do you see a, any 
scalability or greater systemization there that, that we could do or building on that collaborative model that you mentioned? Um, that's that's probably something that we have to explore further, Chair. Um, that one, it could be a little bit tricky because for uh, contracts that we have for ongoing critical services, you know, different agencies may have like different timings as to when contracts expire. So a lot of it can come down to just whether or not agencies are ready at the same time. It may be a little bit easier if you're exploring, you know, something that's new, nobody has yet, but there's a common interest for and, and partnering and ensuring that we can do that together. It, the trick is we want to move fast, but the more the more agencies and more players they add to it, it kind of slows down the process. So it kind of yeah. you have to look at to see if the, the, the stars line up or not. Totally. No, it would have to be kind of a top-down strategic decision amongst various entities to want to build out that system yeah. over time to get some efficiency. So I, I appreciate that. As I said, it's a little pie in the sky, but it also seems like such a shame that we're operating in these in these silos, um, making very similar decisions about very similar tools and equipment and whatnot. Um, okay, so let me move on. Just two other quick questions for you. Um, you know, I noticed that the it seemed like I was a little confused. So on, on slide six, there was a prioritization of these five areas where as you went up, it was higher, it was assessed to be higher impact. Then we had the slides and they didn't quite correspond one to one. So the highest impact was staffing, but then I didn't see a slide dedicated to staffing. And it seemed like the, the, um, the quick wins were sort of about ease of implementation. Did, did we try like a, I don't know, a quadrant like analysis where we're looking at both implementation cost and time on one axis and then impact on the other and trying to find a, um, because it, it just strikes me that when we do these, you know, these big consulting exercises, it, it's sort of the consultant's job to boil the ocean and come back with a lot of recommendations. And I'm, I'm curious to what extent we've, you all have evaluated where you see the, the highest impact for the least effort. And is, is that, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing they didn't get it hundred percent right. Do you have kind of your own analysis on that? Um, so yeah, it looks like, I'm sorry, I just realized that what was a little bit confusing, uh, this, this, the slide on staffing, we actually called backlog. So it, it seemed like, oh. a order, but it was, it was that backlog slide. That's where all the staffing recommendations came from. Um, as I said, um, the, the implementation plan is still something that, you know, we city staff would need to evaluate. It's a little bit open ended because Guidehouse wasn't really sure, you know, whether or not there's uh, the investment decisions on staffing or technology would be there. So we would want to kind of see um, how the budget process plays out this year and see where we land and then figure out how we can prioritize uh, the, the different recommendations and in what order makes sense. I did lay out some things for us as, as um, their recommendations, but a lot of it is sure. gonna be contingent or internal city decisions. Yeah. Yeah, I just always worry with these reports that it becomes kind of boiling the ocean and there's you know this five year plan to implement all these recommendations when we, we sort of have to, I think, push ourselves to find the highest leverage, the highest impact ones. I'm, I'm, especially given our, um, all the many demands on your time. And then my final question was just, um, why is increasing the, uh, the threshold not classified as a quick win? That seems like something that would be relatively straightforward to change that $10,000 threshold, but I saw that was not in a quick win category. Yeah, we agree. I think there's L at home. I think there's elements that we that that in the quick wins that weren't quite highlighted there, but that's definitely a quick win that we would want to bring forward. Um, there's that would require a municipal code update, and so what we're thinking is um, we can look into the areas where it makes sense to bring forward a council for consideration. We might want to do that in a phased process, and we might not have all the recommendations ready, but uh, something like changing the procurement threshold would probably be you know, uh, will be sooner than later, I would say. Okay, cool. Okay, great. I will hand it off to Councilor Cohen, who I hope will also consider making a motion when he wraps up. Uh, sure, um, just just to follow up on, on collaborative agreements. Um, I, I know it's the way this is done often in school districts is that there's what are called piggyback agreements, right? Some, some other 
school district will open a long-term contract for purchase of common items, such as particularly furnishings, classroom goods um, that are common across multiple jurisdictions. And then other school districts can sign on to that as a piggyback agreement to, to not have to negotiate from scratch uh, their own terms. D does this work similarly with cities and other jurisdictions? Do you have those kind of agreements out there where you can piggyback on things that are, are common across multiple um, multiple jurisdictions across the state? Yes, Council Member, thank you for the question. Uh, currently, the, our municipal code does allow for us to uh, piggyback off of other agencies' um, procurements if they have piggyback language written in their procurements that allows us to do so. That's the key. Sometimes um, they don't have the language at all, which means we cannot use it. Other times the language is actually in their contract documents, which is incredibly frustrating, which means we can't use it. So that's also a recommendation I'd like to bring forward is that if piggyback language is in contract documents, we would like the ability to leverage it. Um, but the situate right now as it stands, um, the, the piggyback language has to be in the other agencies' uh, procurements, and sometimes they just don't have it. Um, I can say that our staff several years ago added that language to all of our standard procurements. So other agencies are, uh, they're, they're able to leverage our procurements if their own municipal code or county code or whatever allows for it. So um, we are seeking ways where we could be a little more flexible if the opportunity arises. Great, and I was gonna ask kind of the follow-up question. It's great to hear San Jose's um, setting up contracts that way. Is there some advocacy or work that we can do to to encourage more jurisdictions to provide piggyback language in their contracts so that this would be available to more cities across the state? Um, I'm not sure about that, but um, I can maybe look into it. We could see what the California um, organization of procurement professionals might do, you know, or look at other various professional organizations, but I can't think of a a direct avenue where we might be able to advocate for that short of, you know, just networking and going through some professional organization, but we could certainly keep that in mind. Yeah, that seems like a good avenue for that, talking to others in other cities and at least getting them aware and making more people uh, thought, thinking of that as they as they sign their contracts. Um, and it's a conversation I think we can have maybe with other city officials as we interact with them. But anyway, I appreciate that and I'll move we accept the report. Second. Great, thank you. And in addition to accepting the report, we are referring to full council in May. Is that correct? Yes. So moved. Thank you. Great, let's vote. Jones? Aye. Cohen? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Thanks again, Jennifer and Julia. Appreciate it. And we will move on to our second item which is the status report on the lease and asset management system. Uh, Rob, did you have any other prefatory comments or should we go straight to Nancy? Straight to Nancy. All right, hi Nancy, welcome. Howdy, thank you so very much. We're very excited to be here with you. Um, this is a topic that real estate and IT and finance procurement have been talking about for quite some time. We really are eager to get a lease and asset management system in place, one for real estate so that we can serve the community even better by having uh, an at ready touch system to let us know where uh, we could provide uses or real estate asset for the, the betterment of the community. And two, we have had a number of uh, discussions with other departments so that we could, as a team, look at and understand our classes of assets and look to better anticipating maintenance across categories of assets. So, so that is the work that we believe, uh, we know that this management system will allow us and with that, I'll turn this over to Kevin, who will describe in more detail what real estate and the other departments are engaged in. 
uh, Nancy, uh, that would be me going next, uh, and then Kimberly. Uh, so Kimberly. Sorry, my apologies. No, th thank you, thank you, Nancy. Uh, thank you, and thank you, Rob. Uh, uh, good afternoon, uh, Chairperson Mahan, uh, Vice Mayor Jones, members of the committee, and members of the public. I am Sudhir Bagatti, Products Projects Manager in the C3PO Division of uh, Information Technology. Uh, the agenda for today's presentation is. Uh, we'll have a quick introduction of the team members who are actively involved in driving this initiative. Then we'll move on to defining the primary role and responsibilities of the real estate division, which is part of the Office of Economic Development and uh, Cultural Office. And but this is pertaining specifically to managing real estate uh, transactions, property management, and research. Next, we'll briefly cover the findings and the recommendations by the Office of City Auditor to better manage the city's real estate assets. The next steps in the action item slide is going to outline the process on procuring the database platform in collaboration with the finance team. And the last item is the Q&A session. So this project is led by the following staff members. Nancy Klein, uh, a Director of Economic Development and Cultural Affairs uh, and Director of Real Estate from OED. Uh, Kevin Ice, Real Estate Manager, Yan Bui, Senior Executive Analyst, both from Office of Economic Development. Rosalind Yui and Rob Lloyd are providing leadership and expertise on this initiative. <clears throat> the key stakeholders. So the Real Estate Division collaborated with client departments throughout the city to identify key data sets and programs that needs to be tracked and synced with the new database. The key stakeholders in this project are Walter Lin and Harsh Gautam from Public Works, Nolan Bertuka and Lisa Valerio from Parks Recreation and Neighborhood Services, Rick Bruno and Pedro Romero from Finance, Rachel Vanderveen from Housing, Rick Scott and Jennifer Seguin from Department of Transportation, and Ray Riordan from Emergency Operations Center. And with that, I turn it over to Kevin. Thank you, Sudhir. Uh, hi, I'm Kevin Ice, uh, manage the Real Estate Services Division in the Office of Economic Development and Cultural Services. Our division oversees real estate transactions for the city, uh, including fee or the whole property uh, in easement, uh, both for acquisitions and dispositions. We oversee property leasing, both as tenant and landlord for the city, and manage our program of macro telecommunication leasing for wireless communication facilities. We perform these functions on behalf of the city and our partner departments, managing projects to address the needs of departments citywide. We also help coordinate property management functions and we generally serve as the first point of contact to address real estate related inquiries for partner departments and elected officials. A lot of our work is focused on coordinating with other departments who will all interact with the city's real estate in different ways. Our role as a central hub for the city's real estate management has highlighted to us how an integrated data management system would benefit not just our division, but staff across all departments that use or manage real estate on behalf of the city. And Sudhir, if you could go to the next slide, please. So last year, real estate services uh, was audited and a common theme emerged from the recommendations. Four of the six recommendations are shown here and they relate to the fragmented nature of the city's real estate data. And related to that, the city's property management operations. The audit highlighted the extent to which our real estate data are siloed amongst different departments. For real estate services, navigating this landscape is a challenge that creates inefficiencies. Grabbing onto this theme in the real estate audit, we realized that our desire and efforts to implement a new, more comprehensive real estate and property management database would be a foundational step in addressing, in addressing these ma management challenges. The City Council approved the City Auditor's recommendations in June 2021 and directed us to coordinate with different City Departments. Our discussions with partner departments have revealed that they're experiencing similar challenges and share our desire to have a more cohesive database that allows for better coordination amongst staff in managing the City's real property assets. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Yen Bui, uh, who is a Senior Executive Analyst on the Real Estate Services team. Uh, Yen is our project manager for this software uh, implementation and will run through an outline of the software program that we're preparing to source and implement. Great. Thanks, Kevin. Hi, I'm Yen Bui, a senior executive analyst in the real estate services team. 
So to address the city auditor's recommendations, we're looking to procure an off-the-shelf software that will interface and integrate with programs currently used by stakeholder departments. After individually meeting with partner departments, we identified a consistent need for a comprehensive database for more coordinated management of city properties. Real estate and partner departments are primarily using Excel spreadsheets and layers on the citywide geographic information system to track property information and key features. Each department has its own spreadsheet and database causing information to be siloed. This is inefficient and often requires staff to contact multiple parties to gain a complete understanding of issues affecting the city's property and asset management functions. These same inefficiencies and challenges were identified by partner departments during our individual meetings. A comprehensive database for more coordinated management of city properties would allow city staff to have a clear picture of property information in one place and to ultimately make better informed decisions more efficiently. The software will function as a centralized database that includes a comprehensive list of the city's real estate assets, as well as track and monitor critical terms, deadlines, and property information. The software should provide notifications for key deadlines, such as the lease expiration and renewal dates. It will also function as real estate central invoicing system that can interface with the city's current billing and financial management system. It will ideally help real estate automate billing services to efficiently manage and track payments and auto calculate fees for past due tenants. The software should also have the capability to deliver real-time analytics. Users should be able to customize financial reports for quick and flexible analysis to support decision-making. The ideal system will offer scalable solutions to meet the city's uh, growing real estate demand including property management and the ability to add additional users going forward. The system would potentially allow tenants to submit payments and maintenance requests through an online platform, which would allow the team to efficiently track and request, track requests and allocate resources. Um, next slide, please. Next steps uh, for this project, the Procurement Prioritization Board approved this project on February 22nd of this year. We are currently priority number seven in purchasing procurement queue. Once purchasing assigns a buyer to the project, we'll work, with the, we'll work with them to finalize and publish the RFP and evaluate responses to select and onboard the vendor. Once the vendor is onboarded, the team will work to complete the build out with optimal standardization of data across city departments, which would allow for more efficient management of the city's real estate assets and comply with the city auditors and council's recommendations. Our target date to go live is in December of this year. IT and real estate also recommend supplementing the project team with a data analyst expert to help coordinate data standardization across city departments. Um, in conclusion, IT and real estate will work with purchasing to prepare the software. The software will serve as a centralized database that will house consolidated lease, property, and other real estate related information in a standardized manner allowing information to be easily accessible to departments citywide so staff can be more efficient and better coordinated when managing the city's real property assets. We'll return to this committee to provide a status report um, when the project has significant progress to report. That concludes our presentation. We're now available for any questions. Thank you. Great, right. thanks so much, Jan, and, and thank you also to Kevin Sudeir and Nancy. Um, that uh, looks very promising and uh, looks like a pretty efficient procurement process as well, which is exciting. Okay, let's jump over to public comment. Call in user two, you are up. You are still muted. There you go. Yeah, no comment, I'm good. Okay, thank you. Uh, Blair. Thank you. Uh, just to reiterate my, my words from the previous item and just basically the incredible work you're doing on the previous item. Uh, with, with this item, good luck in, it wasn't some mentioned, but it would just be interesting to know what exactly could be, uh, you know, good human rights, rights practices in the procurement process of, of, of this sort of uh, uh, hey, just on topic, work. please. Uh huh. Well, I'm trying to make a very specific point that what exactly can be the human rights uh, that can be added to the future of procurement of, of real estate uh, uh, assessment management uh, things. Does that include ELI or VLI or what other uh, human rights tools can we use? 
uh, again, uh, yeah, the open public policies uh, and, and accountability ideas that are, that are possible with technology right now. Good luck, uh, and it's civil protection ideas. Good luck in how you can uh, include that into this sort of item. Thank you. Thank you, Blair. Okay, let's go back to the committee. Do we have any hands? Um, okay, well, I'll just say, I think this is an exciting development and I especially appreciate that it sounds like the software will also be external facing and provide some efficiency and value to the folks who are using our real estate. So it's not just an internal benefit that that sounds um, sounds great. So thank you for the update, colleagues. Any final motion. questions or comments? Motion? Motion to approve. Second. Great. Thank you all. Thanks again for the report. Let's vote. Jones? Aye. Cohen? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Thank you. Great. Thank you. We are flying along and we are now on to our third and final item of the day, which is the data initiatives impact status and impact status report. Sorry for butchering that. And uh, Rob, I apologize. Who's kicking us off here? Uh, so, Chair, thank you. Uh, the data initiatives and impacts status report builds on previous presentations on specific departmental efforts uh, showing how the city is moving to coordinated data work. Arthi Tangri, uh, our data architect, is going to lead off for the teams, but you'll hear from multiple departments. Great. Good afternoon, Chairperson, Council members, and members of the public. I'm Arthi Tangri. I'm data architect with the city's IT department. And I have with me here Matt Loish, Assistant Director from Department of Public Works, Vince Pereira, IT Manager, Department of Transportation, and Albert Gahami, our Digital Privacy Officer in the Information Technology Department. Quickly running through the agenda, we'll start out with a little background on um, some of how uh, of our data journey and some of the foundational work that we've done, followed by a couple of examples from uh, public works and transportation, and then we'll lead that into um, the next steps and some of the work we're, we're doing in terms of building the community partnership. Data is a valuable asset and the city recognizes the need to harness data for effective, equitable and efficient service delivery with necessary precautions to ensure users of data maintain the trust of the San Jose community. The city started its data journey in 2016 by releasing the open data policy. In 2017, city released its open data com community architecture, which is built to aid the city drive towards higher level of decision maturity through use of data. In 2019, city launched its new data portal that allowed for a lot of flexibility in terms of the look and feel and the usability of the portal. The new portal also allowed the city to harvest its spatial data and have the data portal as a one-stop location for the residents to find both spatial and non-spatial city data. From the, from the time of the launch of the new data portal, our usage has grown significantly to where we now have 39 non-spatial data sets published, 145 spatial data sets, and six showcases published. And we average around 80 visitors per day on the portal. City has structured its data approach around people, processes, and tools or technology. There has been a lot of foundational work done in all three areas that we would like to highlight today. I would specifically like to call out the entire Enterprise Geographical Information Systems or GIS team led by Tracy Tisbo and Harsh Patham for building and supporting the backbone of most of the data analysis work at the city today. Some of the examples that are being presented today would not have been possible without the GIS team's foundational work. The city has not only built teams to provide the necessary support for data, it has also invested in training the staff to allow them to use the necessary tools and technology to make use of the data. The city has put some processes in place in the form of data chartering that helps identify problem and areas of improvement where data analysis can help move forward toward the goal of better public engagement and improved services using data. The privacy and security reviews that have been put together by our digital privacy office and cybersecurity office have been critical in keeping city systems safe and maintaining the trust with the residents when it comes to use of data. 
There have also been processes put together by the Vision Zero team in terms of utilizing the data from GIS systems and open data portal. Vince will be touching upon those briefly during this presentation. Tools or technology is the last piece of the data puzzle at the city. Highlighting some important work in this area, there is a centralized data platform in use that allows bringing disparate siloed data sets into one central location for all city departments to access the centralized GIS platform, which forms the foundation for the equity work in the city today. The extract transform load platform, which there is some centralization, but then there is also flexibility where other departments are using their own uh, ETL tools. Um, and what ETL tools help is they help move data from the source system to the destination systems for analysis. And lastly, the self-service data visualization tools, um, which are um, primarily what we're using here is Tableau and Power BI, and they have really empowered a lot of city employees to take data to the new level of analysis. In last three to four years, City has significantly expanded its usage of these visualization tools to moving from none to 200 Power BI users and moving from two to 10 Tableau users in the past three years. Both tools offer advantages in different ways and the demand for both continues to go up as we increase our use of data in the city. I would also like to, like to point out the award City has won for its use of data in the form of Smart 50 awards in 2021, Watwork City Silver Certification in 2020 and 2021, Digital City Survey winner for 2020 and 2021, and last but not the least, 2021 Global Mayor's Challenge Champion City Award. These awards validate the city's effective use of data to deliver and improve on services and cultivates an environment for innovation. There has been an increased focus in the city on increasing resident engagement through data by a means of showcases published on city's open data portal. The showcases are structured for maximum engagement. The first level of engagement is through data articles. Data articles are small cogent nar narratives extracted from data. It provides a summarized view of a specific area and targets the residents who are interested in getting high level understanding in an area. For a deeper level of understanding, there are data stories. Data stories are detailed and thorough analyses of data created by an expert. It is a combination of narratives and visualizations that details out the methods, approach, and challenges of the analysis that was conducted. Data stories are targeted towards audiences that are functional experts in an area and can greatly benefit from the detailed analysis of data. The last and most detailed level is the raw data itself. Data in its raw form is very useful for data analysts, researchers, data scientists, and other deep data experts who are interested in working with data directly and possibly combining it with other data sets for analysis. Through data, the city is enabling high-end technical users to bring a different meaning to city's data. Uh, moving forward with the presentation, uh, we'll be covering four main areas, uh, leading with some examples and the next steps. Um, the four areas we're covering, improved, improving city services, measuring community impact, supporting equity, and building community partnerships. With that, I will let Matt take on. Good afternoon, everyone. I want to thank Arti for her kind words about the Enterprise GIS platform and the team. I am Matt Lesh, Assistant Public Works Director and Head of GIS for the city, um, and especially noting Harsh Gautam and Tracy Tisbo for their uh, steadfast work of really leading the technology back end and the forward thinking approach to what we're doing here. Can we go to the next slide, please? On this, so for the better part of a decade, decade, Public Works has focused with our partner departments who have data responsibilities on building an enterprise spatial data repository that has nearly 900 data sets that are maintained in a regularized format that can be consumed through our Esri platform and, and used broadly throughout the organization. These provide quality and consistent information to the city and to the public. 
this focus is now shifting because so much of that data work is now, and we're just kind of data stewards and kind of keeping that up as things pivot and change. We're from shifting to integration, analytics, and the use of data and to support our decision-making throughout the organization. We sort of have a one-two punch approach here, and one using the ETL tools that, like RT mentioned, with an idea of the common vernacular of low code, no code approach, so that there isn't a lot of coding required to access this to provide, to perform automated integrations. And we're also try, we're also are adopting flexible industry standard tool sets for visualization on the spatial side with ArcGIS and Tableau for non-spatial plus spatial data sets. Next slide, please. You've seen some of this before or in, in snippets of other presentations. Um, here you see what we're, which is named uh, San Jose Equity Atlas, and it's in a beta format. This thing is mimicking a uh, city of San Antonio product at the request of the Office of Racial Equity. This map shows an equity index data set, simple score, uh, it's a simple score assigned based on race and or income to a, a census tract. The color shading displays a heat map of census tracts that have a higher proportion of people of color and of low income. This, ha this has been available for departments uh, for the last two budget preparation cycles as a reference platform. This, is, this can be one way for departments to be data-driven in reviewing our investments and our services. Next slide, please. Staff build, so in uh, throughout uh, the, towards the end of, of the, our COVID response and a lot of our work around vaccinations, we built for the EOC uh, a COVID-19 dashboard to allow the EOC uh, vaccination task force to be data-driven in their evaluation of uh, where the vaccination sites are needed. This is an internal map to inform decisions where mobile vaccination clinics deployment might be great or to aid public communications. Um, the index, it is indexed based on COVID-19 cases, vaccinations, and various demographic data sets. This refreshes automatically as data is updated, aligning with county data, um, with the data repository data as we're, our data repository and the county data pulling into one source. Uh, one point of challenge in building this is the county reported all of their data by zip codes for a while, or some of them by zip codes for a while until late. And so our demographics reported through the Census Bureau is sent, reported by tracks, they don't align. And so we had to come up with ways to present it. And luckily towards the end, we convinced them to be reporting it by census tracks so that it would be much easier for these um, visualizations to be available for our staff. Next slide, please. A first view at one of our Tableau dashboards that's being used, it's an internal fuel dashboard that refreshes hourly. Um, that's providing information on all of our fueling assets that our fleet uh, systems maintain that are in various sites around the city. Um, some of the locations not disclosed here. It has locations, tank capacities, current fuel levels, and thresholds. Those red lines are telling our, our uh, fuel managers when they need to be ordering fuel and, and at what rate. And so we have, a, this is a one-stop shop here where they can look at all of the various fuel tanks to see what is the status of the different diesel or li other liquid fuels. Um, previously, staff literally would have to go to papers and sketch out in pencils and track fuels by going to the tanks themselves through the different platforms. It's prone to error, delays, losing a paper, sweaty palms, whatever. And so it was really, this is a much easier way. And this is really critical during our EOC or DOC activations, where we now have this data represented here for fueling operations, basically, but then we also can pull this into other EOC type dashboards. We can see in real time fueling levels throughout the, uh, throughout the city. Next slide, please. On this and then the next, this is um, in connection with our ACS, the Animal Care and Services. One is an operational tool and the next one is a planning and policy tool. Uh, so really for operational purposes, and I think I've shown this once before, this is for our Animal Care and Services dispatch team. They use this map to see active incidents locations so they can assign the nearest field officer members um, based on proximity. It saves times, increases capacity to make sure we're not wasting staff by having them drive around, get them closest to the most urgent incident. But then also gives our field officers access in the field in their trucks for situational awareness because there are situations where we do have uh, dangerous dogs that are known or other potential dangerous situations where they can then see this in real time in relation to the current call. Next slide. And so where the other one was operational, real, what, what are we doing right now? This is meant to be available for our staff to be for planning and for policy use so that 
it shows active calls going back to 2018 so they can see them where they are build up heat maps really analyze the data and this is used by for the office staff to review call volumes identify patterns and evaluate program decisions to see are they making a difference over time or not in the particular areas they're trying to hit for example like where are most stray intake calls coming from and or where do we focus outreach uh, resources to address a particular problem with strays or or the like next slide please and so this will be a series of three slide of five slides that you'll see here. And this is really hot off the presses. It was just released to staff for operational use in about, about the last month. And as you know, uh, 311 uh, continues to gain traction and is a, a vital, important city service. This dashboard provides pro program managers with access to call data in multiple types of view. So you see here, obviously, um, dots on a map of where they're generally located, but then you also see council districts. And so you'll see these tabs. I know it's very faint um, and it's because it's a very busy screen, but you're able to see things. Oop, if you go back to the beginning of that, I'm sorry. We skipped ahead a little bit. I think that's the beginning one. And so you can see the different types of calls geographically by council district and types of calls as well. Go to the next slide, please. Um, this is where you can select either on the right or in the map itself. This is selecting Council District 3. I know you can't see it very well, but this is Council District 3. And the chart and all of the things in the filters, as they select it, all filter accordingly as you select it in real time. Uh, go to the next slide, please. Now, if you remember back when I presented before, for the first time, we created a city neighborhood map. And this now leverages the neighborhoods that are throughout the city, not just the council districts. And so this does the same exact thing as the council district. Again, it just different geographic space, but then also has some additional unique feature that I'll talk about in just a moment. Go to the next screen, please. And this, so this is now by census tract, same information, now census tract, neighborhoods, but both of these have census filters for, that provides demographics as a hover over in the map feature that can show for uh, use of analysis and to tailor community outreach, 311 mailings to predominant languages and the like. So you can hover over it and get the underlying demographics both on the census tract and at the neighborhood layer. So both all of those are embedded on the left side. And, and the final one, please. One more, please. There we go. Uh, so this filter calls by day of the week with quarterly and annual reviews on the left. And so now as things change or as public communication goes out about or incidents happen, staff can see what happens in the 311 center, what calls are coming and when, if there's impacts and so forth. You can look at them over time and see as we publicize and push out new services, we should track the volume and ca calls um, through the month, through the year, and, and quarters. Um, I'll hand it off now to Vince. Thanks. Thanks, Matt. Um, good afternoon, Chair, Council Council members, uh, Vice Chair, uh, Vice Mayor Jones, and members of the public. Vince Pereira, DOT uh, IT Manager. So today I'll be speaking a little bit about um, continuation of our data growth within the Department of Transportation, specifically focusing on uh, the sewers area for this presentation. So first off, um, again, this is a team effort, a great uh, coordination between the uh, DOT IT team as well as the sewer engineering team. These guys are the rock stars. They did all the work um, I merely facilitate. <laughs> so big shout out to Albert Arpit and Anjali from the sewer engineering team and Paulo, Yan, and Jay from the DOT development and GIS teams. Uh, next slide. And so um, this, this slide right here is the consolidation efforts that we have for the sewers program. I have centralized data here. And as we've spoke about in previous discussions, we centralize as much as we can, where it makes sense. No, there's no one size fits all when it comes to data. So we have different avenues and different pipelines when it comes to our data structure. The key thing is to make it consistent, make it organized so we could scale the data. Where by con consolidating data, and by consolidating our sewer application into a single Unity app, we basically took disparate systems that these were used in, pre in the previous years. And then we also took some paper methods and consolidated that into a single application platform. 
by consolidating the application and centralizing the data, it allows us to be organized, structured, and we could scale. The key thing is, is laying the foundation so we could scale vertically and horizontally. So when I say scaling vertically, that means we could continually enhance the application so that we could bring on and be agile enough to adapt to new situations. By scaling horizontally, it's being able to be structured so that we could integrate other applications into our application and vice versa. We could take our data, data sets and move it into other use cases as well, not only for DOT, but hopefully throughout the whole city. So by doing this, we basically have uh, centralized and captured all of our applications and data into a single source of truth now. And that's going to give us more accurate and consistent reporting and analytics going forward. The next slide, please. So just some brief impacts, primarily internally and then indirectly as we go through time, as time goes on, this is going to uh, hopefully benefit the residents as well. So through our sewer systems, we have both proactive and corrective active measures. So from the proactive measure, uh, uh, measurements that we have in place and the workflows we have in place, that's going to optimize the complete system from end to end so that uh, all, the, all the workers, all the crews from dispatch all the way to the closure of a, a ticket or a service request is done in a single system. That's going to optimize the flow, and it's also going to be able to give anyone more of a real-time view of where we stand with it, within that uh, request. If we get a request in from the residents through dispatch, in our previous systems, it was two or three disparate systems. So dispatch had to coordinate with the sewer crew, both verbally and in person, to make sure that it was the handoff was done properly and the information was handed off properly. Now having it into a single system, we optimize that through a continuous process that eventually gets closed out to the dispatch and then out to the residents. So this is basically turning days of work into hours of work, basically. And the, more importantly, it's going to be accurate and consistent along that process. From the data analytics side and the data reporting side, we have now consolidated into a single source of truth, which any historical data, we know that it's going to be accurate. And we know that it's going to go through the whole Unity system. So that data source is going to be um, the, the one container that we pull from. So during this process, this used to take you know, hours or sometimes days where people would have to go reconcile with other people, make sure the data is accurate, make sure that the data is relevant as they're talking to each other. Now it being from a single source, all of that is combined into a single system. So rather than taking a few hours to go through that, or even sometimes days, it literally takes minutes to produce these types of reports. So this, this could be historical over a quarter, over a month, over a year, or it could be a snapshot on a daily, daily perspective as well. The next slide is just a very basic slider. And this will just give you kind of like a high level input of what's out there. Um, this is supposed to be basic because I wanted to keep it simple. This ties into the next slide that that I'll show. That that information is now an overlay into our GIS backend. So we took our Unity system and we do full backend integration so that through the workflow of the Unity system, every time we make a change or we complete a project or do work on it, that gets ported onto a map layer that we have integrated into Unity. And then we have a, the ETL process that updates the enterprise backend on a nightly basis. So we're, we're continuously making sure that this is near real time. We, did, we didn't have a reason to do it more than a nightly basis, so we kept it simple and kept it consistent where that's going to be the case. So for example, this particular view right here, we have the toggle for incomplete requests on. So that's basically the requests that are still remaining within the system. And so that's highlighted by the little dots of, on, the, on, the, on the map. It's able to get a good snapshot so that we can make sure that we're not missing some areas of uh, issues that 
should be addressed quickly. Um, any equitable issues where we're making, making sure we service all the different areas in the right fashion and concentrating and giving them the right time and effort with that place. So by taking the data and overlaying it into the map system, that's giving us a visual view where we could run reports from a historical place, a point of view, but then the crew could also narrow it down to a daily point of view so that they know how to best optimize their workload so that they could address the, the work at hand for that particular day, for that particular week. So there's two folds with that. So that's the consolidation of our sewer systems. Again, we have one more app that we're developing right now, and then that's going to complete the, the development for sewers, taking paper, taking disparate systems and consolidating it into a single source of data and a single application. And then for the next uh, presentation, probably in a month or two, I'll be talking about more of the advanced analytics that we're doing. The, all of the analytics that I spoke about today, we run through Power BI through the back end. And it's more of a human manual intervention where we're analyzing the data um, in, in the visualization view. And then we're, we're coming up with analysis based on that. The advanced analytics are things that we're doing around planning and vision zero. That's taken our data sources and we're partnering with Urban Logic. And we actually have pipelines that feed our data. And that's why it's so crucial that it's structured and organized. We push it into their data platform. And what their data platform does for us, it basically takes our SMEs talking to their data scientists. And with our knowledge, we're giving them the, the information that they need to make algorithms that can actually go through the system and that's where we get to using machine language and artificial intelligence. That point, that's taking the advanced analytics part of it. And that's going to be non-human intervention where that could, the system could do predictions and it could be doing modeling so that we could constantly improve on our services. Thank you, Vince. And good afternoon, committee members. Mayor, Vice Mayor, Chair, members of the public. My name is Albert Gahami. I'm our Digital Privacy Officer. And at the end of this presentation, just want to touch a little bit on looking forward, how we are building partnerships throughout the community and beyond to be able to make more of this work happen more effectively in the future. And I'll start with the people. First and foremost, we are growing capacity in our data equity work. I've divided in two categories, but really we have the muscle. I think of it as the places where we are getting resources, funding, and support, both from the city of San Jose internally, but also from the Knight Foundation, who has recently begun a grant with us on for $750,000 over the next course of the next three years to support equity through data and privacy and really kickstart that effort. On the brain side, really getting in more capacity to really do the work, we've been partnering with universities both locally and outside to create some equity through data fellowship program that brings bright young minds in to be able to help us do both the analytics and also thinking through about how to use the data. And all of this is being put together under our equity through data and privacy program, which will be sitting in ITD, but of course working throughout the city. And that goes to the next slide around processes. Really thinking through, there's a lot of key players throughout the city. I have a bunch of departments and offices listed on the left here around key players, but the common theme being a lot of departments focusing on external facing services focused highly, highly on providing equity or providing services in an equitable fashion across the city. So think parks and rec, Office of Racial Equity, Library, and then of course, great work with Public Works and DOT. Focusing on key initiatives that we have throughout the city like digital inclusion, our COVID recovery work, SJ311, and future services as we're building out in our data chartering, allowing us to define both not only the scope of future programs, but also how to measure their impact, which is something that I think is key to making sure that the programs that we're doing are providing value. And as you can see, of course, the last element here is tools. And 
I want to highlight basically the same things that RT brought up at the beginning. There's three main analytical tools that we've been using throughout the city for this type of work, those being Power BI for many static um, and you know graphs, things like that, ArcGIS for much more spatial analytics, and recently we've been using Tableau, which provides more of a merging of the two, really being able to see both non-spatial and spatial data in one to create uh, some additional interactive dashboards. On the infrastructure side, working both with Dell and Urban Logic to continue seeing how we can flesh out and build out a lot of centralized accessible data stores. And all of this goes to the last slide that really I just wanna highlight a, a brief example um, from some of the work that the Mayor's Office of Technology and Innovation did with our Data Kind Ambassadors and a City Data Equity Fellow, Joy Thu, from, uh, from Stanford University to just highlight that there is work happening today and has been for a couple of years now at least on comparing services that the city is providing with the equity throughout the city. And what we want to do moving forward, both with the partnerships, the additional resources, and the focus throughout many departments here in the city is more views like this, understanding both from, in this case, an income equity, but also, of course, a racial equity perspective. How are our services being provided, and can we improve them in the places that need them most? That's all I have for you today. That's, um, I'm sure the rest of the team is also available for questions. Thank you so much for your time, and happy to respond. Great. Thank you, Albert and RT, um, Vince and Matt. I really appreciate the, the update and, um, and all the work you're doing to make San Jose a more data-enabled city. That was a great cross-section of the many data services you all are working on. And um, I think it's exciting that we can save our staff time, uh, deliver faster, better, more equitable service to our residents. And, and so it's just exciting to see all the progress. And, and clearly, you all have earned the, uh, the awards and, and recognition that were mentioned at the top. So uh, before we open it up to conversation at the committee level, why don't we head over to public comment? I see we have uh, Blair, you are up. Hi, thank you. Uh, thank you for the words of, the, uh, of this item. And uh, the, the last uh, speaker, I guess he's the new digital privacy, privacy uh, director. He offered really, really important words, just how to frame our conversation uh, on the subject of the future of data collection. I've been speaking on this subject matter in these terms for eight years, and I've been getting a lot of harassment about it. Um, I, of course, I lack a certain amount of knowledge, and I'm sorry about that. But it's my goal that we really have to be able to simply the idea is the concepts of equity and, and civil protections and open public policies and accountability and open democracy really have to be on our minds as we talk about the future of data collection and technology in a city. It isn't that difficult to do, but we, we, it, it, is, it is new to do that for us. Uh, we've been coming out of an era of war in 9-11. You know, I started this work back in 2014, and that's what that was where we were at. Yet we're doing this now. We're talking about, you know, inclusion. We're talking about openness, uh, equity practices. It's how to openly define technology practices and data for a city. It's really nice to hear what uh, the uh, the new uh, privacy policy director is saying about this, and and really it's important how we talk about and frame these sort of issues. For instance, we have a whole new set of, of AI statistics and data collection we've been talking about working on this past fall. How is that going? And, and to simply frame that in terms of open public policies and civil protections, um, I, 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 it just creates an awesome way uh, how to consider ourselves and, and really offers the ideas of innovation. So thank you for what you're working on with these things. Consider sanctuary city ideas as policy making as well. Thank you. Thank you. Call in user two. I stepped away for a moment. Are we on open comment? Uh, not yet. We're on our third item. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you. I'll, I'll be back for open comment. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Okay, great. Why don't we come back to the committee? See if my colleagues have any comments or questions. 
Oh, Vice Mayor, go ahead. Yes, it's not a question, but first of all, I want to thank um, the team for that report. Um, I want to reminisce a little bit. Uh, I remember in the early days of the, this committee when we had that dream of having um, the ability to take all the massive amounts of data that we were accumulating and actually doing something with it. And just to see how we progressed is, is very impressive. So I want to commend the team for all the hard work in, in moving this forward, um, particularly around uh, incorporating AI. Um, I, I had the vision and I know the mayor and the other committee members had the, the vision of being able to take disparate data and bring it together in like a data lake and use that data to make you know informed decisions. And it sounds like we're progressing uh, to that direction and that goal. So again, great job. And I will make the motion to accept staff's report. Great, do we have a second? Second. Thank you, Councilmember. Thanks, Vice Mayor. Mayor? I just want to echo uh, everything that Vice Mayor Jones said. I just plus one. Uh, it really is tremendous how much progress has been made. I appreciate everyone's hard work and leadership uh, on this. Uh, I just had a question. I came in uh, as Matt was speaking and, and doing a great job and, and heard the rest of the presentation. Um, I'm interested in knowing to what extent we believe uh, there's still um, value in us emphasizing uh, ensuring we can have an open data portal that has much of this uh, very rich data available and that that robust data lake is available for others to be able to use to, to draw their own insights um, and sort of what we are are not able to do about that given our constraint of resources. Uh, if you want me to take that, uh, Rob, I'll jump on. Thanks, Mayor, for the qu the question. Um, at the very beginning of the presentation, RT did talk about the oh, I'm sorry. open data portal. No, it's okay. The Forgive open me. data portal in, in the access. Um, so there is a, a rich access and, and layers of tools. And if RT would maybe even bring up that slide for you while we're I, I don't want to make you repeat anything. I'll go back and watch it if it's... No, but it's there and it's real. And just as an anecdote around that, Mayor, I think it's really interesting. We partnered with San Jose State on some classwork for some of their uh, advanced GIS classes in their grad school this last year. And every single student was saying how they use our open data portal to access our data and use for their classwork all the time. That's awesome. And they were, and they were saying it's such a huge benefit to them and so many other organizations keep their stuff either closed or, or not siphoned or easy ac accessible. And so they use our da open data portal, both the GIS one, which feeds into uh, RTs in, at the citywide one. And so it's one portal that has multiple entry points. So it, it is used heavily. That's awesome. Great, thank you. Chair, if, if, if I can add on to that, um, and sure. uh, Mayor, it was a, a great question. Uh, three things is the partnerships that um, this investment, the series of investments that the council has uh, pushed uh, since its 2016 Smart City vision um, has allowed us to get to a point where we have a lot of deep partnerships that, that are powerful and also um, in, uh, help us create additional partnerships. For example, with Dell and a lot of pro bono work uh, with, uh, with Harvard, with Duke. Um, these investments propagate on top of each other. Um, Vice Mayor, on your comment, one of the things we have run into, uh, to, to speak to your point about um, those shared regional national type approaches, is we've also gotten no's. Uh, so when we say, hey, we could really share information really well and we could pass our 311 cases that are really some other agencies, they, they tell us, no, thank you, we're busy enough. <laughs> but uh, we at least have the data and the ability uh, to go in that direction in the future. And, and those, those uh, student uses, um, the uh, What Works Cities, um, the City Possibles, um, and, and the universities, it, it has been a very compelling resource. The thing that we're trying to do now, which a lot of cities have really fallen down on, is taking the, um, and Count, uh, Chair Mahan, you spoke to this earlier, the the interspersed one-time efforts that are really powerful and insightful but turning them into a mode rather than an exception and crossing that chasm has has been hard and so how do we get that community of practice those common tools those, those consistent data sets of high value and that's what you're going to hear us speak to the next time we come back on some of those data platforms and approaches is now let's take this from one-offs to very consistent capabilities and then um 
On equity, you'll also hear us um, connect this uh, across all of your comments. Uh, we're teaming up in the COVID Recovery um, Data and Budget Committee to then support those committees, those seven working committees, on what measures they're tracking for that so that we can provide the data um, and the sourcing and the dashboards so that they can say, is our work having the impact that we want? So going from inputs, outputs to actual impacts. Um, and, and we'll see how successful we are there, but our hope is to then come back to you with really compelling work where we translated um, some information, a great community of practice into something that really helped the organization and the community succeed. Thanks, Rob. I think that's helpful context. Just before we vote, uh, Matt, I, I really appreciated the point you made about transitioning, uh, I'll probably butcher this, but basically from creating the data systems to then moving to greater analytics and more informed decision-making. And, and I think the vice mayor was making this point and that we're making progress in that direction. And I was trying to think about how we up-level that for the whole organization. Um, have, have you found what, one function I was thinking of that could be really impacted by the data science you're doing would be the audit function. And I'm curious if our data sets have, have yet, if we found ways of leading to and either kind of generating suggestions for things we may want to audit and more deeply understand, discrepancies we didn't expect, or just you know data that doesn't seem right to us for some reason, or in the other direction, the auditor coming to you and being able to say, hey, we're trying to better understand what's going on here. Can, you know, is, there, is there a connective tissue yet between these systems you're building and these new analytical capabilities and, and our, audit, our, our auditor's office? Uh, Chair, thank you for the question. Uh, there is um, definitively the auditor's office and almost every audit pulls in some sort of our GIS or spatial data and then uses other tools or possibly our, our, GI, our ESRI platforms for some of the non-spatial data as well. Um, they are keen on being up to date. We train them and help them with um, either dashboards or views of the data um, all the time. It's, it's a very frequent collaboration with our team. Um, so yes, to the first question though, are we using it to do predictive audits or like using that? I don't think we're there yet. Um, and I think there are areas that maybe as they're doing the audit, it spurns an idea that helps them dig in a different place um, than they were initially thinking. So I, I don't think we're there yet to find the audit initial audit question, but maybe in in their digging through the data, ideas or issues pop up that they then dig there, dig in specific places as a result of using the data. Sure. Great. Okay. Thanks for that. Well, thanks again for the for all the great work um, you and the team are doing. And not seeing any other hands, I think we're ready to vote. Ricardo? Hi. Jones? Hi. Cohen? Hi. Mahan? Hi. Thank you. Great, thank you all. That completes the agenda and we are on to open forum. We will start with call in user two. Hi there, city council. Pretty disappointed in you guys all the time, especially with these, this new uh, speed camera thing. You guys went and lobbied up in Sacramento, real crafty, real crafty how you're gonna do that. Yeah, and then you want more traffic cops, right? Just what we need. I don't know if you remember back in the 80s, this city gave more traffic tickets than any city in the entire nation. Remember this? Hopefully you guys got some back then before you were city council members. I really do. I hope every single one of you gets one now that you're going to try to install these speed cameras and increase TEU. You guys can't even say the word traffic enforcement because why? It sounds terrible, right? TEU, there's no... Uh, no word, so you don't think about traffic enforcement or traffic cop, right? So you guys are terrible. If this passes with this illegal speed camera, right? It's illegal every place else in, in the state, but no, you're going to make it legal here, okay? That, that's low. That's really, really low. And what's going to happen to your constituents when they start getting tickets that don't have the money to buy things? buy food, buy gas, then they're going to get stuck with a fat fine and fat insurance premium. According to Raul Perales, he wants to make it hurt. I'm never going to forget him saying that. He wants to make it hurt. You know, you're talking thousands and thousands of dollars. That one minor speeding ticket could cause somebody uh, a, lot, a lot of financial loss. And there's no victim. They're driving 10 miles over the speed limit down the street when there's nobody on it. You guys are crazy. 
if you guys have all these traffic cops and these speed cameras, I hope all your friends, all your family, and including yourself, tickets and insurance rates go up. But you know what you're going to do? You're going to pull strings for yourself, your friends, and your family members. And if you do, I hope you get caught, just like Ken Foster did. No, Ken Thank Foster. You. Thank you. We are on to Blair. Hi, Blair Beekman here. Thanks a lot for the meeting today. It was uh, hopeful. Uh, we can talk about the future of data collection in the city. Thank you. Um, I've learned, I think, uh, for the real estate data collection, the term uh, racial equity and income equity as how they're asked about future uh, data collection for the real estate issues. And overall, just a reminder that, uh, you know, open democracy, open public policies and accountability and civil protections really can help organize a really not only efficient way, but uh, just, you know, all, all around better selves in how to uh, build a future of uh, data collection and, and just how we work as a city and, and as people. It's really interesting how that can do that. You know, uh, if we practice and want to think about our better practices of a democracy, that will lead to more efficient, better practices. And that's uh, an interesting concept that happens better when we consider the world and want to work in towards ideas of peace and not war. When we work towards war, we go closed, secretive, uh, don't want to talk to each other, don't want to communicate. I really hope Putin's getting that sort of message at this time and that we all can be constructive in the ideas of asking not to continue the war efforts in the Donbass region and that we can really sit down to the peace negotiation process and uh, really work something out that, you know, all the ideas of racial equity and uh, reimagine that we do in local communities in this country can be of help in some way and how they're going to have to clean up the future of the Ukraine area and its local community. Good luck in these efforts. Let's talk about peace and we can have a peace process by the end of uh, April, I feel. Uh, not more war. We can end more war. And uh, good luck in how we can all talk about the future of, of uh, policing issues and what has happened in the past week. We have good a source to all work together at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, everybody, enjoy the unusually warm weather. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>